to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Lord, what would you have me to do? Acts chapter 9, verse number 6. We welcome you today to our study of the book of Acts. This exciting, this action-packed, powerful book teaches one what must I do to be saved. And today we're thinking about that in our study of Acts chapters 9 through 12. If you don't have your Bible out and ready, we want to encourage you to stop for just a moment what you're doing, locate your Bible, and let's get it ready as we're going to look to the Word of God together. Friend, we want you to know we're so happy that you've joined us for our study today. Today's lesson is being brought to you by Christians, individual members of the Churches of Christ, and congregations of the Lord's Church in your area. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly, uh, whether that be Sunday morning for worship or Sunday night for Bible study, Wednesday night for Bible study. You will find people there who love God, who are concerned about the souls of men and women, and who would be happy to sit down and discuss the scriptures with you. If you're looking for a place to worship, check out the Church of Christ in your area. They'd love to talk to you more about that and study God's word with you. Friend, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also like to help you in your desire to know God and his word better. We have a wide variety of good Bible study topics, all available from our website, thegospelofchrist.com. You can access those 24 sevenths free of charge. We have books on every book of the Old Testament, every book in the New Testament, a wide variety of topical studies. And we'd love for you to stop by and check that out. If you'd like to have a copy of this series on the book of Acts or any of our past series, we make that available free of charge as well. Just go to our website, fill out a media request form. You can access that. Uh, once you fill that out, you can select a digital download, and we can send that to you instantaneously. Or if you need a CD for audio or a DVD for video, then we can mail that to you as well. We also have transcripts, study questions available for you. So check out our website. Great tool for Bible study there. Also, don't forget about the Gospel of Christ app, available in both the respective Play Stores. You can keep up with our new lessons, the things we're doing, and it's a great way to study God's Word in our fast-paced world as well. Today, we're thinking about a pivotal section in the book of Acts, Acts chapters 9 through 12. And really, this section deals mainly with two conversions. You have the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, which a lot of Acts chapter 9 is about. Then you have the conversion of a first openly Gentile, Cornelius, in Acts chapters 10 and 11. And so we're going to be thinking pretty heavily about the subject of conversion. With Acts chapter 9, we begin with the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Let's read a little section together in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. The Bible says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogue of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and it will be told you what you must do. Now, a little background if you're not familiar with Saul of Tarsus. 
In Acts chapter 6, some of the synagogue of freedmen who were in the region of Tarsus of Cilicia were debating with Stephen. They couldn't resist Stephen, the wisdom and the spirit which he spoke. And so they began to plan to remove him. Acts chapter 7, Stephen is still preaching and he now presents the scheme of redemption through the Old Testament prophets and he ends that by saying, you've rejected, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart and ears, you've rejected the just one. You, you failed to see God's plan of salvation. And they ran at him, they gnashed at him with their teeth, they, they take Stephen out of the city and they stone him to death. And Acts chapter 1 says they laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul of Tarsus. And Saul began to wreak havoc on the church. He went on a journey. He had a, a mindset of destroying the church. He was dragging men and women out, committing them to prison. Uh, homes were being broken up. Children were being parentless, familyless. He was doing great harm to the church. And then in Acts chapter 9, this same Saul of Tarsus, he's still breathing threats and murders against the church. He's like, a, he's like a bounty hunter who has official authority. If he finds any Christians, he can now bring them to Jerusalem to be prosecuted. And with that mindset of tearing apart the church, Saul is going down the road of Damascus. And out of nowhere, a light shines around him. He's blinded by that light. He hears a voice. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He doesn't know who it is. And so he says, whoever it is has got to be Lord. Lord, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Imagine what Paul must have felt at that moment. I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. That was the very thing he was headed to do. Don't you know, images of Stephen must have rolled through his mind. Can't you imagine the families he's now thinking of that he drug away from their children and out of their homes. He's holding those official papers about to do more harm on the church. And Jesus says, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. It's hard. Lord, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. A goad is a, will be a sharp pointed stick. Maybe you're trying to move an animal or a herd and you've got a sharp pointed stick and you poke them a little to get them to go the right direction. God had been pushing Saul in that direction, no doubt some, by the hand of Stephen's preaching. Hard for you to kick against the goads. Lord, what would you have me to do? The blinded Saul, who had been blinded by his legalism in Israel and his legalism to the old law, is now blinded by the truth. But doesn't Saul have a great attitude? When I think about the conversion of Saul, one of the things that stands out about him is his heart. Lord, what would you have me to do? Whatever else you might say about Saul of Tarsus, his motives were good. Acts 23 verse 1, I've lived in all good conscience until this day. When Saul did what he did, he did it because he thought it was right. He thought he was doing right in harming Christians, but he wasn't. Now that he is blinded by the truth and hears Jesus speak to him, Listen to his attitude. Lord, what would you have me to do? God says, you, Jesus says, you go in the city. It'll be told you what you must do. Now we find a postscript and a follow-up to that. Of course, Saul is blinded on that journey. He's led by the hand. He goes, uh, uh, he goes to a street called Straight there. He's staying, and he's told that God's servant Ananias is going to come to him and tell him what he must do to be saved. Now, I want you to think about Saul's conversion for just a moment. So Saul goes to the city. He's there three days praying. Uh, look at Acts chapter 9, verse 11. If anybody ever prayed plenty of a sinner's prayers, I'm sure it was Saul of Tarsus. Look at Acts chapter 9, verse number 11. So the Lord said to him, Arise, go to the street called Straight, inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. Saul is blinded. He realizes he's been doing wrong. He knows he's lost and has opposed Jesus, and now he's praying. Friend, if anybody ever said plenty of prayers is a sinner, I guarantee you it was Saul of Tarsus. That's not what he was told to do, to be saved. What did Saul of Tarsus have to do to have his sin removed? Whatever Saul did, 
is what men and women have to do today, right? Look in your Bible. Saul recounts this conversion experience three times in the book of Acts. And in Acts 22, he tells us exactly what Ananias said to him. Open your Bible to this recounting of this event in Acts 22, where we learn what Ananias told Saul. You go in the city, be told you what you must do. Here is that must. Look at Acts 22, begin in verse number 12 with me. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me, Saul says, and he stood and said to me, Saul, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at the same hour I looked up. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will, see the just one, hear the voice of his mouth, for you will be his witness to all men of what you've seen and heard. Now watch verse 16. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. As we mentioned, there are several things that this passage and this conversion teaches us. Saul had a good heart. He had to hear the message of Jesus. He had to turn from his evil ways. But Saul was not saved at the point of prayer. He'd been praying for many days and he wasn't saved yet. Saul had to do what God said to be saved. And listen to it again. My friend, don't miss this, please. Ananias comes to Saul and he says, why are you waiting? Get up and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Friend, if I can know the exact moment in time when Saul of Tarsus' sins were removed, I can know when I'm saved, right? Now, now think about this with me. Does the Bible teach we are lost because of sin? Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says it absolutely does. Our sins separate us from God. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. All have sinned, therefore all of accountable age are lost because sin separates us from God. If I can know when sin's removed, I can know exactly when I'm saved, right? Listen to this again. Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling. On the name of the Lord. When is a person saved? They're saved when they contact the blood of Jesus, right? It's Jesus' blood and his death that saves. When do you contact Jesus' death? Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, Paul said, As many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, listen now, were baptized into his death. Why is it Saul of Tarsus' sins were washed away at the point of baptism? Because baptism is when we contact the blood and the death and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Friend, you cannot say, you cannot say and you cannot teach that baptism is not essential to salvation. It's the exact moment when Saul of Tarsus' sins were washed away. It's the exact moment, the Bible says, when we contact his death. His death saves. I contact his death at the point of baptism. Now, friend, listen carefully to this. You know, we also learn another great truth here. This is a passage that helps us to realize when we call on the name of the Lord. What does it mean? to call on the name of the Lord. A lot of people go around and they'll quote Acts 2 verse 21. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What does it mean to call on God's name? Well, according to the divine commentary of Acts 22 16, it means you get up and do what God says to be saved, which includes arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, having called on the name of the Lord. I can't say I've called on the name of the Lord until I'm willing to do what God says which includes being immersed in water for the forgiveness of one's sins. And so Saul's conversion is so crystal clear. Friend, have you done what Saul did to be saved? Have you heard the voice of Jesus as found in the Bible? Have you believed that he is the Lord, the Savior of your life? Are you willing to turn from a life of sin and turn to God in repentance, Luke 13, 3? And have you done what God said to be baptized to wash away your sins? Acts 22, 16. Let's then think about the example of Cornelius now. Some really interesting things unfold with Cornelius. Cornelius is a Roman centurion who would be a proselyte uh, to the Jewish, or not a proselyte, who would be a, a, a Gentile who God now is going to reach 
uh, with the gospel. He's a good man. He's a good moral person who still needs to hear the gospel. Look in Acts chapter 10 and notice what we learn about Cornelius. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. And about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up as a memorial before God. And so Cornelius is a good man. He's a good moral man. He's a benevolent person. You'd be glad to know Cornelius. But he was still lost. He still had to hear the gospel. And so God tells Cornelius, I've heard your prayer, and I'm going to take care of that. Now there's another man by the name of Peter, uh, who, as we recall, Peter is a Jewish man. He's lived his whole life by the Jewish law, and Peter is praying. And, and in this prayer up on the rooftop, he now sees a vision in a trance. And so he sees this great sheet let down. And there are all kind of animals in that sheet that, that the Jews were forbidden to eat. And so a voice says to Peter multiple times, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter says, no, Lord, I've never done that. That'd be, that'd be against what I'm supposed to do. And God says, don't call unclean what God's called clean. And about the time that vision ends, there's a knock at the door. And it's those sent from Cornelius' house to gather Peter to have him come preach the gospel. And kind of, you can see the wheels turning. God's not talking about animals. He's talking about people. These Gentiles knock at the door and they say, please come tell us the gospel. And now things kind of begin to fall into place for Peter to realize what's going on here. And so Peter comes to Cornelius' house. And Cornelius is so overwhelmed that a, a, a Jewish man would come in and teach him the gospel that when Peter comes in, uh, Cornelius falls down before him. And look at what Peter said. Look at Acts chapter 10, verse number 26. But Peter lifted him up saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. Whoa, 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 wait now. You mean to tell me Peter didn't say to Cornelius, Here's my ring. You want to kiss it also? Peter, who many claim was the first pope, didn't even allow Cornelius, a Gentile, to fall down before him. He didn't say, don't you like my hat? Want to kiss my ring too? Don't you know I'm the first pope and this is what you ought to be doing? You don't find any of that in the Bible. In fact, what you find in the Bible is contrary to that. Call no man father is what you find in the Bible, Matthew 23, 9. What you find in the Bible is Peter saying, get up. I'm just a man like you. I don't deserve your worship. Don't fall down before me. And so Peter, it's not like many in Catholicism have made it out to be. That, that, that's contrary to what you find in the Bible. Peter preaches Jesus to Cornelius. Peter preaches that God is not prejudiced, but everyone who works righteousness and does his will is received by him. And so as he preaches the gospel, the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius just as it did on the others in Acts chapter 2 as a sign that the door has now been opened for the Gentiles to enter God's kingdom. And so Peter commands them. Acts chapter 10 verse 48, Peter commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit fell on them, signed their welcome into the kingdom as well. They now do what God says to be saved, and Peter commanded them to be baptized. And so just like with every other account, Acts 2, Acts chapter 3, uh, Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch, here's water, what did it hinder me from being baptized? Acts chapter 9 and Acts twenty two sixteen. 16, Saul had to do the same. Cornelius and his household, entering the kingdom, they were commanded to be baptized. Friend, please understand that a person can't disobey the commands of God and be pleasing to him, can they? Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, it, it's not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, that's going to heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. He's the author of his eternal salvation to all who obey him. And so Cornelius and his house, they were commanded to be baptized. Now, watch what, as Peter, as this happens, 
God is now going to show the Jews by Cornelius' example that the Gentiles are welcome into God's kingdom, the one body as brothers and sisters together. Acts chapter 11, Peter is going to recount what happened with Cornelius. He's going to tell about his vision. He's going to tell about going to Cornelius' house. He's going to tell about talking to them. And, 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 and he's going to tell about how the Holy Spirit fell on them just as it did on us at the beginning showing the doors were open to the Jews, showing the doors of the kingdom were open to the Gentiles. But he's also going to mention something here. Cornelius, who was a good man, who wanted to hear the gospel, good people still have to hear the gospel to be saved. Look in Acts chapter 11. God says to Cornelius to send for Simon, whose surname is Peter, verse 14. He will tell you words by but you and all your household will be saved. I remember talking to an individual one time who was not a child of God and talked to him about trying to become a Christian, maybe having a Bible study, something of that nature. And his response to me was, I'm just as good as some of those people down there at the church. My friend, it's not, it's not a matter of goodness that we're talking about. Here's, here's what I want you to hear. Good people are still lost and outside of Jesus until they hear the gospel and do what the Bible says to be saved. Cornelius had to hear words whereby he and all his household could be saved, implying that he was not saved, he was not in the church, the, the covenants had changed, he was not inside God's church, and this is what he needed to do to be saved. And friend, regardless of a person's goodness, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all men need Jesus to be saved. Acts chapter 11, verse number 14. Now watch something interesting that also happens in Acts chapter 11. A after the Jews have come into the kingdom, after the Gentile, the doors are open and the Gentiles are now in as well. Look what is said in Acts chapter 11 about these followers of Christ. Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul, verse 25. When he'd found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church, taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. You know, that isn't just kind of an incidental matter. This is actually the fulfillment of Scripture. Isaiah 62, verses 1 and 2, God said, When the Gentiles see my righteousness, I will call my people by a new name. Cornelius, a Gentile, first time, saw God's righteousness, and moments after that, they were called by a new name. They were called Christians first in Antioch. A follower of Christ, what are they? N not a denominational name, not some man's title, not some religious group. What are we? Christians. We're just simply followers of Christ. We're trying to be like Christ, 1 Peter 2, 21. We're trying to follow in his footsteps. We're trying to do everything that God wants us to do to be pleasing to him. And so just like in Acts chapter 9, just like in Acts chapter 2, just like in Acts chapter 8, Cornelius and his house, they hear the word. They believe in Jesus. They're baptized for their mission of their sins, and they're added to God's kingdom, and they're called Christians. Nothing more, nothing less. And friend, as you study the book of Acts, that's the pattern and the plan that you'll find throughout. Does that mean there won't be problems along the way? Flip over to chapter 12 and you see there are. In Acts chapter 12, we now have a violent scene that unfolds with one of God's servants. Peter is freed from prison. And yet we see the destruction of one of God's people at the hand of an evil, ungodly ruler, how things are going to work out. Uh, Herod is doing great violence against the church. John is there. And because it pleased the people, bad things happen. Evil governmental rulers and bad things happen in this scene. John is killed with the sword uh, at the hand of Herod to please the people. Uh, Herod thinks he's a god. He gives this great speech. And of course, God's going to show him he's not. But listen, you see that bad scene unfold, unfold where John is put to death. Peter's put in prison. Peter's freed out of prison. John, he goes on to heaven. 
what, what happens to the church? It looks like, this is an event where it kind of looks like Christianity and the church by evil governments are going to be snuffed out and this is just going to kind of shut it down. Not at all what happens. Look at Acts chapter 12, verse 24. In spite of this, after Herod's violent death, the Bible says, but the word of God grew and multiplied. Friend, it was not the case that Herod was going to win. It was not the case that evil governments then were going to win. It, was not, it is not the case that Rome who many thought was going to be victorious over Christianity, would win. The book of Revelation tells us that. Evil governments, evil governmental rulers, as you study Bible history, God uses them in His plan in some ways, but they're not going to be victorious over God and His church. The Word of God, well, God and His Word will always triumph in the end. Friend, how does that relate to our lives today? As we've thought today about Acts chapters 9 through 12, We've seen the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, one of the great persecutors of the church. We've seen Cornelius, a Gentile man, and his family come into the kingdom, Acts chapter 10 and 11. We saw the violent death of John, and then God taking care of Herod, and God taking care of Peter. The Word of God is always going to win. God's always going to win. His Word is always going to win. Jesus said in Matthew 24, Heaven and earth will pass away. My word will never pass away. Matthew 24, verse 34 through 36. And so, friend, we encourage you today, if you've not done what people did in the book of Acts to be saved, won't you do that today? They had to hear the word to be saved. Acts 11, verse number 14. They had to believe. Jesus was the Son of God. Acts chapter 8, verse 36 and 37. They had to repent of sin in their life. Acts 2, verse 38. Acts 3, verse 19. Having confessed Jesus, we also must be immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. If you haven't done that, we'd love to help you with that. If you are a Christian, then friend, our encouragement to you today is keep living the Christian life. In the end, Christianity, God, His cause, and Jesus will be victorious. Let's be faithful unto death. Join us next time as we study more from the Word of God. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.